Well, good morning, everyone. It's uh, really wonderful to be here. It's my honor and uh, privilege, and I'm humbled by uh, what Pastor Matt has had to say. Thank you very much for having me today. And uh, it really is an honor to be worshiping with you this morning. Thank you for the invitation to be here and uh, to join you today. I've been in the, the United States for um, almost, well, about 10 days now. I started in Denver, Colorado, and then uh, spent the rest of the time here in Texas and had a, a wonderful time. And I go back tomorrow uh, to, uh, to England. And um, this has been a great place to conclude my, uh, my time here in the, in the US on this particular trip. I'm backwards and forwards quite a lot these days. Well, why don't we, um, uh, as we come to God's word together, why don't we begin with a word of prayer? Let's pray. Our Lord and our God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, what I want to... Uh, talk to you about this morning uh, is the gospel and our culture. The gospel and our culture. The uh, subtitle, Translating Our Faith for All of Life, gives you a sense of the direction that uh, I want to go in with um, this message this morning. But we live in um, challenging and difficult days for Christians. I don't know whether you've noticed that, uh, but around the world, around the Western world in particular, uh, we're accustomed to thinking about parts of the East, uh, the uh, Islamic world, the communist world, as being difficult places for Christians. We're not so accustomed to having to reflect on the fact that the Western world, Europe, Western Europe, Britain, Canada, the United States are becoming increasingly difficult places, challenging places for Christians to articulate the faith, the content of the faith, uh, to uh, find themselves um, in difficulties in the workplace, in their vocations, uh, losing their jobs because of their commitment to Christ and so on. These are difficult and challenging times, and I think it brings us to a very, very important question. And it's the question I think that Christians today in the West, again, must ask themselves in a way that we haven't had to ask perhaps for maybe 1,500 years. And that is, what is the relationship of God's word revelation to our real life in the world? What is the relationship of this word to our real life in the world? In education, in political life, in family life, in business life, in economic life, in the law, in the sciences, and so on and so forth. What is the relationship of God's word to our real life in the world? What is the relationship between the gospel and culture. Now, when we think about the claims of Christ, the claims of Scripture, and culture, we naturally think about religion and uh, the state, the nation, the community. And uh, the word uh, religion, I think, is a is an underused word now. Um, it kind of has a negative connotation. You know, uh, well, I'm not religious, I'm spiritual, people say. Um, of course, the Apostle James says, you know, true religion. What is true religion? Well, the interesting thing is that the origin of the word religion, religio, uh, in the Latin, literally means to tie or to bind it's an agricultural metaphor, and it was about getting things growing in the same direction. How do you get things to move and to grow and to develop in the same direction? That's the origin of the word religion. And the question which confronts us again today in our culture 
is what is the direction of our society? What is giving direction to our communities, to our families, and ultimately to our nation? What is the tie that binds? Because actually at the root of every culture is fundamental religious commitment. I'm going to talk about that a bit this morning. But religio or religere, to tie or to bind, has to do with that big question of what is it that holds a society together? And as we see increasingly in the West and even here in the United States, a polarized society, a divided society and a divided nation, what you're actually looking at, what you're witnessing is a religious crisis. A religious crisis of commitment. So let's go to the Word of God, to Colossians chapter 1, and think about, as we think about our religious commitment, that is our fundamental commitment, our spiritual commitment, to the person of Christ and who He is. Paul is talking, as he writes to the church in Colossae, about the Lord Jesus Christ, beginning in verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and by him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile everything to himself making peace through the blood of his cross, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Once you were alienated and hostile in your minds because of your evil actions, but now he has reconciled you by his physical body through his death to present you holy, faultless, and blameless before him. If indeed you remain grounded and steadfast in the faith, and are not shifted away from the hope of the gospel that you heard. This gospel has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and I, Paul, have become a servant of it. Now, I just want you to notice in this passage, especially in verses 15 through 20, what it says about Christ, about our religious foundation for life, about our fundamental, most basic commitment, That Christ is the very representation of the invisible God. Here is the Word made flesh. Here is the eternal God manifest in history in the man, Jesus Christ. Everything was created by Him. What does that leave out? Nothing. Nothing. Everything was created by him. The things you can see and the things you can't see. Not just the spiritual powers that you can't see, but other things that you can't see. For example, have you ever seen the number one? I'm not talking about the fridge magnet for the kids. Have you ever seen number? Have you ever seen a law of thought, a law of logic. Oh, look, there goes a law of logic. (laughs) Now, there's many things that have been created, but we cannot see them. So the things that are seen and that are unseen, all the rulers, the thrones, the dominions, the authorities, both in heaven and in earth, All forms of authority have been established and created by God. Verse 17, he is before a few things. And by him, one or two bits and pieces hold together. Is that what it says? No. 
all things hold together. Some translations say, in him all things consist. They hold together by his word. He's the head, other images here. He's the firstborn. What place does he take in everything? First place. Not just in the church. Not just in the family. But in everything. He is to have first place. And he is reconciling, verse 20, a few spiritual people and a few bits and pieces to himself. No, he is reconciling all things to himself. You know, that reconciliation, of course, doesn't mean that everybody's going to be saved. What it does mean, though, is that nothing, what it means is that nothing will be outside of or without the authority and the lordship of Jesus Christ standing over it. That's what it means. So in Philippians 2, you remember in that great hymn of the early church, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Some willingly, some unwilling. But every knee will bow and every tongue confess. Now, we're told that this is accomplished through the work of the cross, through the reconciling work of Christ. Now that is probably the most succinct statement, Colossians 1, of the Christian view of reality in the Bible. There are lots of statements, and of course the Bible is a statement of God's view of all reality as the creator and redeemer, but this is Paul's probably most succinct statement of the Christian view, the religious foundation on which we build our lives. That foundation, though, of course, is not the one that most people are building on today. Commenting on the life of um, the famous German philosopher Nietzsche, he was a godless man, he proclaimed, God is dead, thus spake Zarathustra. What he meant was, God is dead for us. As far as we're concerned, God's irrelevant to our lives. We don't need to factor God in. And he, he was in the 19th century. He prophesied that society would take him more and more seriously as time went on. He, he believed in a, a kind of philosophy called nihilism. Nihilism means basically there's no meaning in anything. If there is any meaning at all, it's only what you privately give to life. You might assign this or that a meaning, but there's no true meaning that comes from God. Now, there was a Christian apologist called G.K. Chesterton, and he was reflecting on the life and thought of Nietzsche. And Nietzsche had ended his life insane. He ended it in an asylum. He lost his mind. That's what happens when you turn away from God ultimately. You steadily lose your mind. Right? You st steadily lose a grip on reality. Chesterton said, the man who thinks without proper first principles goes mad. The man who thinks without proper first principles goes mad. Colossians 1, these are our first principles. Christ. Now, when you look at our culture today, madness would seem to be the right term to describe much of it, wouldn't it? I mean, if you'd have told my grandparents that there were going to be, by the time her grandson was having children of his own, that uh, there would be 72 genders, she'd have suggested you needed to be committed to some sort of institution. <laughs> madness is an accurate term to describe many of the first principles today of our culture. The word of God for our social order has ceased to give shape increasingly to our society and sometimes even to large parts of the church. And instead, what's put in its place is the will of human beings, our desires, our preferences. They're permitted to determine truth, and justice. And when our ideas and our 
preferences, and our desires start to redefine truth and reality, we run into all kinds of problems. There was a, a Canadian thinker, there are one or two, not many. Um, one of the great things about speaking in the US is you get some really cheap jokes at the Canadians. It's, <laughs> Well, I'm actually here with my colleague, Bart DeVries, uh, who is our uh, Director of Operations here in the US, and he is Canadian, and I'm also a uh, British Canadian. I'm a dual citizen, so I'm allowed to poke fun. Um, but do speak to Bart afterwards. He'll be at our book table. There's a Canadian thinker, George Grant. He was a, a kind of God-fearer, but he was not a Christian. Not in the sense that we would understand a Christian. Somebody who is born again, who knows Christ who has accepted Christ as Lord and Savior. But he looked at the culture in the middle of the 20th century and he realized there was a serious problem. And one of his biographers summarizing his thoughts said this, that this is what he understood about the West. Justice is understood to be something strictly human, having nothing to do with obedience to any divine command or conformity to any pattern laid up in heaven. Moral principles, like all other social conventions, are something made on earth. Human freedom requires that the principles of justice be the product of human agreement or consent. That is, they must be the result of a contract. And these principles must therefore be rooted in an understanding of the interests of human beings as individuals rather than in any sense of duty or obligation to anything above humanity. The terms of the contract may well change as circumstances and interests change, but the, free, the restraints free individuals accept must always be horizontal in character rather than vertical. Let me interpret that for you in English. What he's basically saying is, our view now is that we don't have any accountability to God to anything laid up in heaven, no commands of God, no requirements of God, the only accountability we will accept at best is horizontal. That's to other people in society in the context of a social contract. And we can update that contract as we go along. So, for example, we no longer need to accept that God made the male and female and established the meaning of marriage as we've accepted for centuries. Now we can update, it's just a social convention. We can change that, we can update the contract, we can redefine it. We can redefine it all. That rejection of vertical accountability for horizontal relativity has had now a very, very dramatic impact in Western society. Here's just a few things. We're conferring on ourselves all kinds of contractual rights now. So we've got the contractual right now to redefine gender irrespective of our chromosomes. You know, every cell in your body defines what, whether you're a male or a female, right? You know that. Amen. Every cell in your body. We've got the contractual right now to murder the unborn We've got the right in much of the West to polygamy, to homosexual marriage. It's not marriage, but they call it that. To almost any sexual predilection. We've got the right to suicide. Euthanasia. Do you know that in Europe, we're euthanizing children in, um, in Canada, it, this month, actually this March, there's a further ex extension of euthanasia rights so that teenagers, children, minors who feel depressed can go and get the state to execute them. There are people actually fleeing parts of Europe, like the Netherlands and Belgium, to Germany to get away from the euthanasia laws in those countries because actually Germany's had a little bit of a break on it on that front because of everything that happened with the Nazis.
the elderly and the sick. Don't get sick in Canada today. Don't be elderly or sick in a hospital. They'll pressure you to be killed. We've got the right to prostitution and pornography. The right to suppress the worship of the living God. The free speech of Christians. The right to any number of blasphemies. And it's all dressed up in the garb of freedom. Human dignity. You know what they call the euthanasia movements in Europe? Dignitas. It's all dressed up as a form of autonomy, of freedom. And so we live in an era of revolutions. Revolutions. Few would deny that our Western principles are shifting like sand underneath us. And what's that, what that's meant is that there's a sort of metamorphosis happening with, this, with respect to the Christian and the church's relationship to the culture. Because things have been changing so rapidly... Christians and the church are asking themselves, how on earth do we respond to all of this change and the speed of this change? When I arrived in Canada 20 years ago, there was no such thing as homosexual marriage. Shortly thereafter, there was. In the last 20 years, it's like our culture has been like lemmings plunging off a cliff. Many of the leaders in the churches across the, nation, across the Western nations have forsaken under the pressure of the culture scriptural and historical understandings of our faith. So the question of the relationship of the gospel, of this word revelation to our culture has perhaps never been more important, certainly not in any of our lifetimes. What is the relationship of God's word revelation to our real life in the world? Well, let's think about that. We've seen from Colossians 1 the meaning of the gospel. Christ's death, his reconciling work, his kingship and lordship over all things as creator and redeemer. Let's just think about culture for a moment. Gaining a proper understanding of how the gospel relates to our culture means that we do need to think about the meaning of the word culture. Well, the English words culture and agriculture They're derived from, like many of our words, a Latin root, cholere, but they're related to another uh, interesting word, cultus. Culture, cultus. Now, the word cult is familiar to us because when we think about, say, the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Mormons, whatever, we talk about the cults. These are cults. They're not Orthodox Christianity. They're cults. Cult means worship. So the root meaning of culture is actually worship. In fact, culture is perhaps best understood as the public manifestation of the worship of a people. The public manifestation of the worship of a people. When you look at, and culture, of course, you know, we, we say, we talk about business culture and arts culture and sports culture and It's an overused word. But culture is what's going on in our society, and it is basically our religion, religio, externalized. It's our applied beliefs. It's what we believe put into action. That's the meaning of culture, worship. Culture is therefore a state of being that's being cultivated. All these words have a relationship usually agricultural, they're being cultivated. So your mind, your heart is being tilled over all of the time, even when you don't realize it by what you watch and what you read and who you you mix with and all these different aspects by the law, which is a teaching device, where we get our education. All these things are tilling minds and hearts, cultivating us. And if you look up the word culture in an older dictionary... You'll also find that culture means a type of civilization. A type of civilization. So, you think about it. The individual's mind and heart is cultivated in terms of a cultus, in terms of a certain kind of worship. 
And as that happens in people's lives, it forms a type of civilization. The United States of America, founded on English Protestantism, really, evangelical faith. That's the root of the culture, commitment to the word of God. It was the same in my own home country, of course, and, and in Canada. And that, that cultus is always a community thing, which means it's transmitted through the family, through education, through the law, through the arts, shaping all of cultural life. It's religion externalized. I was going to cite a philosopher here, but I'm going to pass over that slide. Just you can jump to the next one. I want to illustrate this practically for you. If you go to Saudi Arabia today, if you were able to get on a plane right now and just fly to um, Riyadh, or to uh, Bangkok in Indonesia, or to, um, to, say, Lahore in Pakistan, where my parents lived and worked for about 17 years in Islamic culture, what kind of culture are you going to experience? An Islamic culture. In Saudi, in Pakistan, in Indonesia. And it's there, it's reflected in the law. It's called Sharia law. In the diet, halal food. In the dress code, the women will be in various different types of head covering, sometimes a full burqa, covering their face, everything, just a little gap for their eyes. It's in the education, in the madrasas. In every aspect of life, the religion, the religio, the cultus is externalized culture. If you go to North Korea or China today, much of China, there are about 100 uh, million Christians, though, of course, in China now. More than all of Europe. There are more Christians worshipping Christ in China today than all of Europe put together. Nonetheless, at the moment, China, North Korea, what kind of orientation does the culture have religiously? It's Marxist. It's communist culture. It's an atheistic culture. If you go to Tibet, what kind of a dominant religious culture do you experience there? Buddhism. It's there in the dress code, the temples. Same with much of India today, which is still in the grip of Hinduism. And the religion is there again in the dress code, the temples, the diet. Also, it's actually present to such a degree historically in the culture in India that it's there in the surnames of the people because of the caste system within India, which determines, at least culturally, your social class. Religious commitment shapes culture. Who is Lord? Who is God? Now, if you come to the West today, what kind of a culture do you increase, increasingly experience? A humanistic, secular culture. Now, I will confess that coming to certain parts of the United States, including parts of Texas, feels like the sort of atrium to church compared to uh, uh, Toronto uh, or, or London these days. There, there is still a lot more influence in much of the United States of Christianity that's much more visible, much more prominent. It will still be shocking to most uh, Europeans coming to the States when they get into a cab or whatever and the guy's listening to worship music and, you know, it's, 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 being, it's being played in stores. And stuff. That, that's foreign now to, to, to Western Europe. So there is still much more here. But nonetheless, you know, if you go to, um, to England, the, the motherland, in every village... In every town, you will see a spire, sometimes more than one. Historically, the most expensive building in the village or the town or the city, cities with cathedrals. They represented the center of meaning. 
The reason they were built right at the heart of a community with a tall spire is here is the center of meaning. Here is the religious meaning of the culture. It's Christ. But these are now really cultural vestiges. There's holdovers of Christianity, of course, in our language. But there's pagan spirituality everywhere in the West. There's Islamism increasingly. Many of the churches in a place like Toronto in Canada, where I lived for many years, do you know Toronto used to be called, it was so Christian, they used to call it Toronto the Good, the City of Churches. About 70% of the population in the 19th century would have been in, in church on a Sunday morning. Well, things have changed. You get the point. And so the spiritual mainspring of Western culture has been undergoing this seismic shift so that the gospel has ceased to give clear direction to the historical development of our society. Even here in the Lone Star State, and I know yesterday was Texas Independence Day, a great day, but in, I've been talking to Matt and Austin, San Antonio, Dallas, Houston, these are increasingly liberal centers of progressivism, shaping the culture, giving direction to our cultural life. So when we think about this, it's that when you have a spiritual uprooting, the one that's going on right now, it's a very preca precarious place to be because what you start to see is society then beginning to come apart in various different ways. And then people start looking for people to blame. They look for scapegoats. And Christians will be one of them, I assure you, the main one. So culture is religion externalized. It's the expression of a pe people's worship as they cultivate their society. Now let's think for a second about the direction of culture. In, let's go to the Bible. In biblical categories, culture is what human beings make of God's creation. So you're sitting on a chair right now. That's a piece of culture. That wasn't there in the garden. Right? Adam didn't say to Eve, first day, pull up a chair, let's sit down and talk about this. <laughs> there were no chairs. Vines, creation. Wine, culture. Sheep, creation. Sweaters, culture. Iron ore, creation. Motor cars, culture, you get the point. Culture is what human beings make with God's creation. And our first parents were set in the garden of God as kingly priests in a cosmic temple to worship and to serve, we're told, to rule and subdue, to turn creation into a God-glorifying culture. That was the commission, rule and subdue. Worship and serve. And that commandment has never been rescinded as an act of worship, as kingly priests to turn God's creation into a God-glorifying culture. Great theologian Herman Bavink, he said this about Genesis 1.26. He says, Genesis 1.26 teaches that God had a purpose in creating man in his image, namely that man should have dominion. If now we comprehend the force of this subduing or dominion under the term culture, we can say that culture in its broadest sense is the purpose for which God created man after his image. So you can't opt out of this. If you're a human being, you're a culture shaper. You're a culture maker. Because everything that you do in your family, in your activities, in your work, in your civic life, social life, it's all forming and shaping the culture around you. We will turn the visible and the invisible materials that we talked about in Colossians 1 of God's creation into culture, either as covenant keepers or covenant breakers. Either will be obedient or disobedient, faithful or unfaithful. 
There's nothing in between. There's no neutral culture. We as image bearers of God cannot help but shaping culture. It's part of who we are. That whole idea of image bearing in the Bible is not so much an... um, uh, an, I'm trying to think of a straightforward word to use. It's not so much an ontological idea. That's not a straightforward word, is it? That's not helpful, is it? Um, It's not so much our being, like that you're a finite replica of God. It's to do with direction. Direction. We are called to reflect God's will and purpose to creation. That's how we image him. So it's not that I'm a finite copy of God. It's that I am created to image his purposes in all of creation. And this antithesis in cultural life, this opposition, faithfulness, unfaithfulness, is exactly what Paul tells us in Romans 1, where he says there's only two possible directions for culture. He says there's worship. Remember cultus, worship? There's worship of the creator or there's worship of the creature. They exchange the truth about God for, actually, a better translation would be the lie. And they worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator, Paul says, who is blessed forever. So there's actually a, a worship exchange that happens first. Then there's a truth exchange. They exchange the truth about God for the lie. Sorry, truth exchange first. They exchange the truth about God for the lie. And then there's a worship exchange. They worship and serve the creature, something created. That might be human ideologies, but something created. And then there's a sexual exchange. That's the first way it's expressed when you've got religious apostasy. Interestingly enough, Paul says in Romans 1, truth is exchanged for the lie. What's the lie? Genesis chapter 3. Has God really said? You will not surely die, but you will be as God. You can determine for yourself good and evil, right from wrong. That's the lie. You exchange the truth about God for the lie, and then you worship and serve something created. So there's a truth exchange, a worship exchange, and then a sexual exchange, because they exchange then the natural use of the man and the woman, Paul says. And they burned in their lust for one another, men committing shameful acts with men. So, one culture rests in the worship of creator, the other in the worship of creation. And that means it follows there's no such thing as a neutral culture. There's no neutral school. There's no neutral family. There's no neutral state. There's no neutral government. There's no neutral laws. Jesus said, he who is not for me is against me. He who does not gather with me scatters abroad. No institution, no cultural activity can be religiously neutral. Now, Christians who worship the living God and unbelievers who don't, of course, pursue many of the same cultural tasks. You might say, well, Joe, don't uh, non-believers build schools and make films and have law firms and et cetera, et cetera? Don't we do the same things? Well, yes, we do the same things, but we do the same things differently. We do the same things, but we do the same things differently. We may both marry and build families. We may both make and perform music. Let's take music as an example for a moment. The musical notation for, if you pull up the next slide, I think, for um, Lady Gaga, she's at the top there, and Johann Sebastian Bach underneath. Now, they're both using the same C major, Same B flat. But nobody would argue that the direction of their music was the same. This is the distinction we have in Scripture that we can call structure and direction. God's created all things. He's established and ordered all things. He has structured all things. There are many structures within creation. But there are two directions. 
Faithfulness, covenant keeping, unfaithfulness, covenant disobedience. Obedience and disobedience. Structure is God's good creation. Direction. Structure concerns God's creational laws and norms and patterns for family and church and state and so on. The direction concerns the religious orientation they have. Many structures, two directions. That distinction between structure and direction is, is helpful because we live in a fallen world. A broken world. We have the problem of sin in all of our human activities and our human institutions. Think about marriage for a moment. When Jesus taught about marriage, he was asked a question about marriage. He didn't say, well, let's do a quick study of the Greco-Roman world and see what they think. When he was asked about marriage and divorce, he said, from the beginning of creation, it was not so. But God made them, and he quotes from Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, and he says, but God made them male and female, and the two shall become one flesh. So when Jesus is asked about something, he goes right back to creation order, creation structure, as the right ordering. So the structure of marriage is the same as it's always been from the beginning of creation. The challenge in marriage, of course, is the hearts, the lives of those in the marriage relationship. When a Christian marriage should look different from a non-Christian marriage, because a non-Christian marriage may be legally, structurally the same, but is it oriented towards Christ? Submission to the Lord Jesus Christ? Service of the Lord Jesus Christ? Recognitions of God's order and structure within marriage? No, it's not. When, uh, as a pastor, couples came to me and said, my marriage failed, I know what they meant. But it wasn't marriage that failed, was it? And it wasn't God's structure, it wasn't God's institution of marriage. It's the problem of sin in the hearts and the lives of those within the marriage. Right, that's the problem. So when we look at a state or a nation that's failing, or a church that's failing... It's not God's order for his church or God's order for civil government that's a problem. It's the hearts and the lives, the ideologies, the disobedience, the unfaithfulness of those involved. So if you've got a corrupt police officer, you don't say, let's get rid of the police. We don't need law enforcement. You redirect law enforcement to righteousness. If you've got a corrupt judge and corrupt courts, you don't say, let's get rid of justice and judges. You say, no, we need righteous judges and justice, yeah? If marriage and family is collapsing, we don't say, let's get rid of marriage like Karl Marx. We say, no, let's reorder and structure marriage as God intended. That's what we say. If we've got a, a, an abusive church, we don't say, let's get rid of God's church, we don't need it. We say, no, we must have godly leaders, godly authority. That structure and Direction, And that tells you that the problem in all of these institutions, in every aspect of cultural life, is religious. It's religious failure. It's an issue of the heart. At root, they are religious problems. If we don't take seriously oaths, whether it's in marriage or whether it's the president taking the oath of office on the Bible, which, by the way, used to be to an open Bible, to Deuteronomy 28. Did you know that in the United States? It used to be the oath of office on an open Bible to Deuteronomy 28, invoking the blessings and cursings of God upon the nation for obedience or disobedience. Wow. Let me conclude with this. Don't get too excited. There's a few minutes left. <laughs> the transformation of culture implicit within what I'm saying this morning what God's word is teaching us is that the Christian gospel then involves a particular vision of culture. Remember, we're talking about the relationship of the gospel to culture. Why? Well, because the gospel itself is a culture because it's centered in the worship of the living God through Jesus Christ. 
the enthronement of Christ the Lord over the heart, mind, soul, and strength of every believer. Remember what Jesus said when he's asked about the greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. So the, the fact that the gospel is going to form a new type of culture is inescapable from the meaning of both the gospel and culture. Follow this closely. If culture is the public expression of the worship of a people, cultus, remember? If it's the public expression of the worship of a people, it's the best looking apologist in North America today. From... Amen. Amen. <laughs> Let me get back to this. If gospel, if culture is the public expression of the worship of a people... And the gospel restores man to true worship, then the gospel restores us to true culture, which is the kingdom of God. Did you follow that logic? Culture is the public manifestation of the worship of the people. If the gospel restores us to true worship, then it restores us to true culture, which the Bible calls the kingdom of God. How did Jesus teach us to pray? Thy kingdom come thy will be done where on earth as it is in heaven this is gospel culture we were made as integral beings that means that we weren't created so that we'd be kind of schizophrenic in our lives so that when we're in church and amongst believers, we have one view of the world, one Lord, one particular rule and government. And then as soon as we step outside a church building or the house, we're under some other Lord and government and king and authority. No, we, we were created to have integral lives. Each area of life submitted to the Lordship of Christ. And that effect affects, of course, the new birth in us affects a radical change in the heart, in the center of our being. When we come to faith, it takes time to work itself out when we're new believers, as our understanding grows and develops. But when the heart, which is the root of our being, it's not just your emotions in the Bible, the heart does not mean the beating organ here. It means your thought, your will, your imagination, the root of who you are, the I, the person you sing to in the shower, that's the heart, right? The heart, the root of the human person, the root unity of who we are. Now, if that's transformed and changed, it's like having the palm of your hand. If this is the heart and these are all the aspects of your life, this is the palm, the root. This is the foundation, the root. And it spreads out then to every aspect of your life. Now, if that's true, and then we look at the condition of our culture, we would have to say that the state of our culture is in some measure due to the apostasy and disobedience of the Christian church and family from our calling. Amen. Because Jesus said, you are the light of the world, you are the salt of the earth. You bring light into dark places, you are the preservative. Actually, that word there in the Greek is very interesting. It's literally the aesthetic. You bring, you're the beauty of the world. You're the flavor of the world. You're the taste of the world. And so if our culture is becoming distasteful, what are we doing about it? How, how is the fruit of our lives impacting and shaping the culture? Because since the so-called enlightenment, you've heard of that, haven't you? The enlightenment Humanists named these periods of history. They called the Christian era the Dark Ages. Actually, credible historians don't use that phrase anymore, but we used to. The Dark Ages. And then when they rediscovered Greek pagan philosophy, the humanists in the West, they called it the Enlightenment. But since that falsely labeled Enlightenment, we have surrendered steadily the organs of culture, education, law, art, charity, medicine, almost entirely to secularism, and very often to a humanistic state. We've retreated into a pietistic bubble concerned only with saving souls from hell, and we've limited Christ's jurisdiction and his word to the church institute. But Jesus doesn't claim in Colossians 1 just to be Lord over the church institute, does he? 
He claims to be Lord over everything. The result has been the marginalization of the church and a change in the public religion of the nations, a change in the public sphere. If we love God and our neighbor then, a full-orbed gospel that applies to all of life, to all of culture, will be of importance to us. Importance to us, not just our inner piety, that's important too, but out of that inner piety, our inner walk with the Lord, the transformation of our lives, our families, our communities, our culture, our nation in obedience to Christ will be important. And this concern is found everywhere. By the way, that picture there you're looking at, I should explain, the top picture is the Prime Minister of Britain today. He's actually a pretty decent man. He's a decent man. His name is Rishi Sunak. He doesn't know the Lord, though. He's a Hindu. And that's him worshipping at 10 Downing Street in London. Don't forget, Britain constitutionally is a Christian country. The head of state, King Charles III, is the titular head of the Church of England. Underneath is the First Minister of Scotland. He's a Muslim, and that's him worshipping with Muslims in his parliamentary offices in Scotland. Now, I point that out because I'm, saying, I'm showing that, uh, now, you know, Rishi, Rishi Sunak, he went to a boys' school, I think it was Winchester Boys' School in England, and, and let's just say that he had his Hinduism watered down. Okay? And, and basically, he's been shaped and formed by what was left of Christian culture. So he's not trying overtly to push Hinduism onto the country, or covertly as far as I can tell. Nonetheless, he doesn't, he's not a Christian. He doesn't confess Christ. This is the nature now of what we are facing right across the West. I'm saying that the Christian faith is no longer giving the lead. It's no longer giving the lead. But the concern for cultural transformation is found everywhere in Scripture. I'm almost done. The Bible is filled with accounts of God's servants confronting idolatry and false worship and transforming kings and kingdoms and cultures with the truth. Moses confronts Pharaoh, the God of Egypt. The God of Egypt. He was thought of as the son of the sun god Ra. Moses didn't say when he sent to to let the people go. He didn't say, well, Lord, you know, spiritual leaders shouldn't confront political leaders. That's a violation of church-state separation. (laughs) I mean, you can can disestablish a church, sure. And I think we had it right in the United States with federal-level separation of church and state. The goal of that was to protect the freedom of the church, by the way. Right? Some states did establish churches at the regional level, but there was no federal establishment of a church to preserve the freedom of the church, preserve Christians from persecution. That was the idea of it. But Moses doesn't say, well, I can't confront Pharaoh because we've got to maintain some kind of... No, he confronts Pharaoh with the claims of God. Nathan confronted King David over his adultery. Elijah confronted Ahab for his lawlessness. Daniel confronts the pagan king, Nebuchadnezzar, until he acknowledges, and I quote, the Most High is sovereign over all the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes. Nebuchadnezzar said that. Do you know what he went on to say? He was converted, it's clear. He says, his dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven for all his works are right and his ways are just. That was because of the witness of Daniel in Babylon and his friends. Jonah confronted the heart of the Assyrian Empire, Nineveh. And it was followed by citywide repentance. Amos prophesied to the surrounding pagan nations for violating God's law. John the Baptist confronts King Herod about violating God's design for marriage. He loses his head for it. Esther intervened with Xerxes on behalf of her people. 
Nehemiah petitioned the king of Persia for the return of the Jews to Jerusalem. The apostle Peter confronts the Jewish Sanhedrin. He says, should I obey God or men? You tell me, he says. The apostle Paul confronts the Athenian court. Felix, Festus, Agrippa with the lordship of Christ and the gospel. Jesus himself called Herod Antipas a fox. It wasn't a compliment. And he said to Pilate, you would have no authority or power over me save it were given you from above. Why did they interfere with the cultural life of the nations? Well, the answer is given in Psalm 2. Can I encourage you to read Psalm 2 in your own time this afternoon? Read what it says about It's a messianic psalm about the kingship of Christ. Why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain against the Lord and his anointed? And there's a commandment given at the end of that psalm to all of the judges and the rulers and the kings of the earth. Be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, do homage to the son lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. And I want to say this about that text and about what I've said this morning. God does not hold a referendum on the identity of Jesus Christ. It's not a vote. It's not a democracy. He's not asking for you to cast your ballot for or against. Christ's kingship is total, it's absolute, it's asserted, it's real, whether we like it or not. That's the claim of scripture. The voice of the people is not the voice of God. You know the French Revolution, vox populi, vox dei, the voice of the people is the voice of God. No, it isn't. The voice of Christ The voice of the scripture is the voice of God. And Christ is not king because I accept it. His word isn't true if politicians say it is. It is true and he is king. And nowhere is any king or judge or culture anywhere in the Bible called to be neutral with respect to the claims of God or his son. Oh no, we're a a multicultural society. We have many gods. We can be a multi-ethnic society. Praise the Lord for that. Praise the Lord for the diversity of God's people bringing their contribution. But remember, because of the meaning of culture is worship, you cannot have a multicultural society when we mean many gods. That's polytheism. Such a culture has the seeds of its own destruction built into it. You cannot serve more than one ultimate. There There can't be more than one ultimate commitment in any society without that society steadily imploding. Scripture is plain that all things were created by him and all things are being made subject to the Lord Jesus Christ and we are to pray for his kingdom and his will to be done. So let me summarize by saying this, all worship, all lordship, all sovereignty either belongs to Christ, the creator and redeemer, the transcendent source of all truth, or you and I are going to find the God concept somewhere in creation among human beings. And do you know what the favorite idol of human beings has been throughout most of history? The state itself. Pharaoh was worshipped as a god. Nebuchadnezzar, do you remember what he did? Set up that great statue of himself for everybody to fall down and worship. When you read about Baal and Molech and Moloch in the Older Testament, these are all the gods of state. When the, the apostles, when Paul is writing to the church in Colossae, do you know what, the, do you know what the, the, uh, the, the, the worship of the Roman Imperium is? It's the Caesar cult. The Caesar cult. You know why early Christians were persecuted? Is because they wouldn't say, they wouldn't take their incense put it on the altar to Caesar and say, Caesar is Lord. Because if they did, they could get a license to go and worship any God they wanted, including Jesus. Just say, Caesar is Lord, and we'll give you a license, and you can go and worship any God that you like. 
The early Christians said, no, we'll be good citizens, we'll pay our taxes, but Jesus Christ is Lord, and he's Lord over Caesar. <laughs> if you want to hear more about that, I'll be talking about that tonight. G.K. Chesterton, who I began with, correctly understood the implications of this antithesis when he said this about the nations of the world. It is only by believing in God that we can ever criticize the government. Abolish God and the government becomes the God. That fact is written across all human history. Whenever, wherever the people do not believe in something beyond the world, they will worship the world. But above all, they will worship the strongest thing in the world. So we will worship the triune creator or we will worship the creature. But the gospel tells us that Jesus Christ, both fully man and fully God, is sovereign Lord, and he alone is worthy of all worship, praise, and glory. And the prophet says, of the increase of his government and of his peace, there shall be no end. The earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And his resurrection, life, and power means not only the transformation of all culture, it means finally that all men and nations will bow, as Philippians tells us, at the feet of Jesus. Amen.